I'm a verified Taylor Swift fan. Elliot is a Swifty. Yeah. My son is. You know how that works. No, don't, don't, it's, don't use your son as a front. We know you love Taylor. <laughs> you know what? I'll say this about her. She gives people their money's worth. I know people who've gone and they're like, you know what? She tries. <laughs> well, I would hope so. Well, you know, some don't. I've been at concerts I before understand. where. No, I, I saw Timberlake years ago and was like blown away. Like he just, no intermission. He just gived her for two and a half hours. Welcome to 32 Thoughts, the podcast presented by the GMC Sierra AT4X. I'm Kyle Bukoskis. He's Elliot Friedman and Dom with arms wide open. Shramati is our producer. Elliot, we have a very busy show here, so we should probably not waste any time. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're, we're oh, going to okay. violate. I, I'd like to apologize to John Bucha Gross in advance because we're going to violate the Bucha Gross rule, which is get right to it. Okay. Okay. But... I have never had more DMs in my X account or my Instagram account than I did about one particular topic this week. Like I was deluged with them. I could not believe how many of them I got. Was and it about our Montreal rebuild talk? Surely no, was it, was, a... it was not about that. Okay, so I just wanted to shout out Nick this is one of the people who wrote to me, and I think this pretty much uh, gets down to the heart of the matter. Like I said, a ton of messages like this. Always appreciate your podcast, but noticed when you mentioned the coach from the Avalanche looking like a Seattle grunge guy and then played Creed on the pod. Come on now. Creed is literally from the opposite end of the country and is a fourth wave diet caffeine free grunge band. <laughs> Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Nirvana, Mudani, all applicable answers. I forgive you, but it had to be said. Signed, a Seattle resident who loves hockey. I had close to 20 of these. Kyle. I believe you have a voicemail that we have to play. Yes, there was a number of submissions in the thought line the last few days on this topic too, Elliot. So why don't we roll that while we're here? Hi, Elliot, uh, Dom, and Kyle. This is Mike calling from Vermilion, Alberta. I'm here with my kids, Jude and Abby. And we were driving, listening to the latest edition of the 32 Thoughts podcast when Elliot mentioned... Seattle grunge music from the 90s. And Dom, I think this one's probably on you. You went to a clip of Creed singing Higher. And I just have to say that's a bit of a disgrace because not only is Creed not grunge, they're certainly not from Seattle. And that song barely made it into the 90s. And I just think that was a real missed opportunity. And, you know, I understand maybe you couldn't get... <laughs> You couldn't play the 90s grunge from Seattle because it was too expensive to get the rights, but you would have been better served by playing nothing at all instead of Higher by Creed. Uh, we still like your podcast, but that was a real moment that gave me a real apoplectic response. <laughs> have a great day. Bye-bye. So, Dom, I want you to understand what happened here. You com like This year, the biggest issue on the pod was the triangle controversy this completely overwhelmed that and that in that voicemail you have multiple generations of a family complaining about your work how do you defend yourself for the shame that you have brought on the 32 thoughts podcast for this hold on i i need a second to to stop laughing on my side of the mic. Hold on, I just need to collect myself. <laughs> I also want to tell you that at least one of your coworkers at Sportsnet 650 in Vancouver sent a note saying, you have to trash Dom for this. Oh, I think I know who it was. Is it Dan Riccio? I cannot confirm or deny. I never really reveal who I speak to. Okay, I am going to publicly apologize to all of our listeners uh, of the 32 Thoughts podcast because, yes, I got very cheeky with the edit in the last podcast. I had two songs queued up. 
Creed, Pyre, and I had a song from Pearl Jam because I knew Pearl Jam was from Seattle. And Dan Riccio, my coworker, being a massive grunge fan, I was going to do him a service and play him some Pearl Jam. But then I thought, why don't we have some fun and poke a little fun at Oh, Reece. wait, 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 wait. You're claiming you did this on purpose? Yes. This Kyle, was all done you, sarcastically? Yeah. Kyle, are, are you buying what he's selling? This is a hard one, Tom. To set this kind That's of That's a no, range. by the way. Kyle's too nice. I am not buying what you're selling. I googled is Creed Grunge. <laughs> <laughs> and it came up as the post grunge era and i thought if i put this in here people are going to lose their minds and boy was i right i am so sorry to everyone that i had a laugh at your expense oh come this is the whack this is the week like you know what no i'm not no 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 we are not you uh, eat it take the you are not spinning this as you joking with everybody and, and screwing with people's minds, take take the L, take the sack. Don't throw an interception. Take the sack. I'm sorry to everybody. I feel terrible. I'm sorry. That's better. We have solved the problem. We apologize to all the Seattle grunge fans. Like I said, I don't think I've ever got as many DMs about a single thing that's ever happened on this podcast, aside from this. I am not letting you spin this as your joke on the world. No chance, Sir Do not mess with the grunge community, and Dominic has spoken on the podcast today. By the way, John, sorry for the delay getting to the topics. Great interview with Brendan Dillon. That was very good. He threw 37 punches. I stopped counting at 20. What an answer. Really good. And with that, we should get going here. Elliot, back to the hockey chatter. Why don't we start in Pittsburgh? The Penguins for each, they are 6-9-3. and three. That game Monday night against Dallas, man, was that a tough first period to watch. This week, they traded Lars Eller back to Washington for a couple of draft picks. Kyle Dubas told local reporters it's allowing some younger players they feel deserve a shot with the big club, some more minutes, Sam Poulin being one of them. Elliot, you know sometimes when you go to a fireworks show and mm -hmm. a few minutes prior, there's that one blast that set off as kind of a, hey, everyone, look over here. The show's about to start. Is mm -hmm. that maybe what uh, this Eller transaction represents for what's going on in Pittsburgh? I, I think so, but I don't like, like people are wondering about like massive earth shaking moves. I, I don't know that we should be expecting that. Um, you, you know, that game was very tough to watch the other night and they've had a few of those, like the game in Edmonton, only uh, Blomqvist who was just sent down to the minors was the reason that game wasn't equally as lopsided. He was brilliant on a night that the Penguins were very leaky. And the one thing about Pittsburgh is that since Crosby and Malkin have got there, they've never thrown in the towel. And, you know, I'll say this, you talk about what we ripped Dom for at the, at the top of the podcast. I wrote in my notes that Jon Snow does not bend the knee. Well, I got hit by the Game of Thrones people who are saying, you know what, he did bend the knee at least once so oh, i was even like we, ha we have week. to stop we have to stop with the culture references here because we're just not very good at them but you know i i think they're they're look like they've missed the playoffs now a couple years in a row and they're really gonna fight have to fight to make it this year and it's not trending very well i think what dubis is trying to say is that sooner or later you can't just keep trying the same path you know, they, they tried last year, um, they didn't make it. And I, and I think what he's trying to say is you've got to do something a little bit different. And the other thing here is, and I didn't write this, but someone called me and mentioned it to me this morning before we recorded, is that, you know, Dubas is a seven year term. So his mandate is to get them through and in, get them through the Crosby era. And I hope it never ends. The guy is still a great player but prepare them for what it's going to look like when it's over, right? So at some point in time, um, 
it has to start. And I think what Dubis is trying to say, and this is the key, like when I, when I saw the Eller deal, I, I said to myself, he's going for the lottery tickets. He's going for the lottery tickets. Like, like if you look at Montreal this year, you know, they've got a ton of picks in this year's draft, like more and more lottery tickets. But, you know, someone said to me, don't call it that because what Dubis has said first is that if he's going to make deals, he wants young players who are ready to play. Like he's looking for young NHLers or young prospects who are, you know, have been drafted, are close to being NHL ready if they're not already there. So he's not really looking for lottery tickets. Eller's different. He's a rental. That's what you get. Um, but, you know, like like the one, one thing one guy said to me is it's going to be interesting with a guy like Pedersen, Marcus Pedersen, because there's more and more D being taken off the market. Like Adam Larson signed. And not all these guys shoot the same way, but Adam Larson signed. Uh, Jake McCabe signed. And, you know, as I, as I wrote yesterday, there's a lot of people who think that Gavrikov, like LA is going to make sure they keep him. So that may increase the amount of interest uh, uh, there is in Pedersen. It should help you make your deal. He's got some guys like Nedeljkovic has got another year. Achari's got another year. He's got to decide what he's going to do with these guys. Um, you know, so he's got some of those players who've got another year and O'Connor, Although he doesn't have a ton of points, he doesn't make a lot of money and he can go up and down your lineup. Now, I know that's not what everybody's thinking. Everybody's talking about Sid. Like, would Sid ever wave? Would Sid go? As I said before we interviewed him in Vegas, Kyle, I think if he was going to go, he wouldn't have extended. I, I, I think it was in his head to stay. He wanted to stay. He wants to be a Penguin, despite the fact that uh, Nathan McKinnon would drive to Pittsburgh tomorrow, throw Crosby in his trunk, and take him all the way to Colorado <laughs> without stopping. I, I think Crosby wants to be a Penguin. The only thing that I could ever see changing it is if deep down Crosby was always convinced the Penguins were going to try to contend, and he looks at this and says, holy smokes, we're waving the white flag and I won't be able to stand this. That's the only way I could ever see it changing, and we're not there yet. Um, and I don't know if that, that would ever happen during season. I just don't know. But I don't think we're there right now, and the Penguins aren't going to him to say, would you want to go somewhere else? I don't think. I think it would have to be him do it. So I think it's way – like I understand it's sports radio talk or sports podcast talk, and I get it. But in the reality of the situation, I don't think we're there. You know, Malkin said something uh, really interesting uh, the night of his ceremony when he kind of just talked about how he's happy there. And that's that's what I hear, too. I heard they have no interest in moving him, and he doesn't have any interest in leaving. And, you know, the other two guys, Latang is a really tricky one because of all the injuries in the term. Um, like, I know there's teams out there that really love Latang as a player and have real respect for him. But... You know, it's, it's because of the contract, it's really risky. And I think there are insurance questions with the contract, so it makes it even more risky. The one to me is Carlson, and it's going to be Carlson's call. It's going to be up to him. And, like, Carlson's money goes down. His salary is It drops to nine. Then it drops to seven and a half. And, you know, after his bonus is paid this summer, I think his bonus this summer is $5 million. So if he gets traded after his bonus is paid, which is what happened when he got sent to the Penguins, the financial responsibility of the new team gets even less. Like, you can't tell me, and again, it's up to Carlson because he's got the protection, you can't tell me that with that bonus coming off and a little less salary due and with a little bit of retention from the Sharks, that there isn't a team out there that wouldn't take a shot at Eric Carlson. I, I just find that hard to believe. But like I said for the 98th time, it's it's going to be up to him. It's concerning just looking at the attendance and how it's dropping there out of the gate this year, Elliot. I mean, what, it was 15 years since they, they had built, you know, what's now PPG Paints Arena, where it was sellouts every single night. They had such a good run there. Obviously, that's not going to last forever, but... I did the game there. We talked about it in early November. Their game before that was on Halloween night. Anaheim was in town. So got the fact that it's Halloween. Anaheim isn't the biggest draw there. And I think I was reading, you know, Josh Lo Yo of the Athletic saying that that was the the lowest attended game that they've had in the history of 
of that building since it opened in in 2010. Uh, you just worry about apathy starting to set into the market, which is not something they've had to deal with really in the Sidney Crosby era. But maybe if there's one silver lining through all of these tough results and tough decisions that have to be made, if there is an actual, a tangible shift towards moving younger and trying to carve out a path of where they ultimately hope to get there with a new era of players and uh, a new feel around the team somewhere down the line, maybe that helps drum up some interest, right? Like your line, are you selling wins or are you selling hope? Uh, maybe they need to start selling some hope here uh, before too long to try to get the interest in the market that is such a great sports town somewhat on the uptick again because it's just been tough to watch there. It's not something in really most of my lifetime I'm used to seeing here. Well, you know, the the fans there have had a great run. Uh, they and I, I'm, they enjoyed every second of it. But that probably gives, like, the Penguins even more incentive to start changing their team. Like, fans vote with their wallets, right? Mm -hmm. We don't like your product. We're not coming. And if the fans are telling you they don't like your product, then you can't sit still either, Kyle. You know, the other one for me there is Sullivan. Um, yeah. You know, like... Uh, like he was in Toronto, you saw him. He that that's not a coach who's who's giving up. Like he's a determined guy. He wants to. He's got pride just like everybody else. Like to me, it purely comes down to it's going to be hard to find a better coach than him, right? Yeah. Like yep. there's there's if you're gonna if you're gonna rank the coaches in the NHL, you're not gonna rank too many above him, even though it's not going really well now. The only reasons you're, you're firing him are, number one, is if you don't believe these players are listening to him anymore, and we're talking about the key players, and I don't believe that's the case with him and Crosby at all. I believe those two are very much on the same wavelength. But if you believe that he can't get this player group of players to play anymore, then that's why you're doing it. Or you just you're just convinced that he can't win there anymore, like which is probably basically saying the same thing. You're not making change there for change's sake because a he still cares and he's still trying, and b it's hard to find someone better. You're making change there because you think it's run its course, and even if you turn the roster around, you don't believe he's the guy that can win with the group you're going to put together. That's it. Penguins are in Columbus Friday night. You joked about Nathan McKinnon a moment ago, Elliot. The Avalanche, they have won three in a row. It has allowed you to build on your in-season cup lead. You know, I do not get excited even, or Even down. the trackers are, like, tearing into you right now. I don't get thrilled or disappointed with results watching hockey over the course of the season, Elliot. But, man... I was in the dumps last night after the Kings let that one slip away there. Slip away? It's, they didn't get a shot for the entire second period. Well, they had a lead, and they couldn't <laughs> hang on. It's tough to see Kemper go down. I oh, stuck was, on that one was day. Tough. That, 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 that was tough. Like he, I felt bad for David Riddick. You're sitting there for two hours, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, get in there. Like Talk about a no-win situation. My in-season cup is just, it's a series of missed opportunities. It's like you prior to the spring of 1986, Elliot. <laughs> that's, that's, very, uh, that's very clever, Bukowskis. <laughs> well, so the you avalanche. Say, you're, you're, the guy on the, you're the guy on the pool that can say, I'm number one. Like, you can just go with <laughs> that's that. That's right. Go with I'm, that. I think now I've got to turn my attention to just being the, the last day with the cup guy. That's my only ch hope. <laughs> so the avalanche uh, fridge well look like uh they put chris wagner on waivers on uh thursday they activated jonathan drouin they activated miles wood and Nich uh, is eligible to play on friday i mean the one guy we still don't have clarity on still is landeskog who who stopped skating for a bit you know the one thing i asked was is the, the fact he stopped skating does it mean that there's any change in expecting him to play this year and i was told no uh, nothing has changed in terms of the uh, overall picture, although everybody knows what a challenge it is. 
But, uh, you know, I hope people got their licks in on them early because, as you said, they've won three in a row. And, you know, the thing I'll really say about the Avalanche, I give them a lot of credit. Like, those guys played hard. And their best players, like, they really dragged them through it. Rantanen had the hat trick the other night. McKinnon's been fantastic. McCarr's been terrific. Uh, they've all, they're all among, like, the top scorers. Uh, the other guys in the lineup have really pulled their weight. Like, uh Ivan Ivan, you know, he gave them good minutes. Sam Malinsky, he's given them really good minutes. Even uh, Georgiev has kind of pulled them together a bit after Anunin held the fort while he was working on his game. So, like, th that's the one thing. I, I, I look at the Avalanche and I say, um, when they were really down, they didn't let themselves get out, and everybody there pulled their weight. Like, that's a team that should be really – they won't be – because that's not the way they're wired. But I would be proud of what I accomplished up till now in, in, a, in the maelstrom they were in. Like, they competed. They, they, they showed everybody that when we're healthy, we're going to be a beast because we're hard to handle when we're not. It's just a great sign or example of a, a team that's, that's very much right in how they operate inside the room, right? Where there's no sense of do not approach this as this is a tough break and ah, what are you going to do about this? They went out and found answers. And when you've got the top guys on your roster or on the payroll that are wired that way, the trickle down effect is pretty neat. I mean, for years, we've talked about a team like Boston being examples of that. And we're seeing it here with with Colorado. It's like the start of their season. They were the, the blue ghosts in Pac-Man a little bit, you know, vulnerable to be eaten. But those days feel over as the cavalry is coming wow, back. Wow, the blue Denver. ghosts. You remember that, what? don't you? Oh yeah, I remember. I'm old enough to remember when Pac-Man first came out. Right, and were you a big arcade guy? You would go not to the bad. arcade lots? Not bad, you know, I did. I, I went, uh, my parents didn't believe in video game systems at home. They, they didn't like that. Um, as a parent now, I'm completely the other direction. My getting Max off my uh, you needed like the jaws of life to get the nintendo switch out of max's hands oh, yeah. but back then like my parents didn't believe in that we didn't have any video game systems at home uh actually you know, my dad did when i was in grade 13 that's how old i am grade 13 he bought me a pong like he said here oh I got wow something and it was a pong which i love but we didn't believe in that so yes i went to the arcades to to play the to play the games yeah it's funny like that was a cultural thing back then where it's like why would you have video systems at home when you can just go to the arcade but now it's completely the other way around and from video games to video review elliot it's a funny place this oh, earth eh? like a few days ago at the gm meetings you know as we discussed in the podcast so the kind of the vision the future of how they wanted video review to be was discussed and then Toronto, Washington, Wednesday night, three video reviews on goals alone. Two of them took goals off the board. Another confirmed a no goal call on the ice. I, I appreciate what you said not too long ago that this podcast is for trying to find solutions, not solely about complaining, though we do our fair share of that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> there was a lot of complaining on Wednesday night. Yes. Yeah. And so I just watching that as tough as it was at times and, and how long some of the reviews took, it's hard to find or think of what would be a viable solution to remove the delay and to try to cut down on some of this stuff. What do you think? Oh my God, Kyle. So that game, I was just like everybody else. I was a fan. I would finished my writing. I was in my jammies. I was on the couch. I was ready to turn off my brain and watch some hockey. And in the middle of that game, I was ready to ban video review. Not just at the end of the season, but actually right during the game. I was prepared to tweet, we need to ban video review right at this moment because I couldn't watch another one. I felt bad for the fans watching that game. I felt bad for the fans in the building. I felt bad for the players, and I'm sure the people in the NHL situation room, they wanted to unplug or throw away their phones. I bet you it reached a point where they didn't want to do another review either. It was it was too much. 
And you'll remember, Kyle, there was a game a couple of years ago, and the Devils fans will remember this. They had a big winning streak, and the Maple Leafs came to town, and they had three goals disallowed during the game. And they were all the right calls. It snapped the winning streak. But after a while, it's just like, I'm sick of this. I don't want to see this. It's bad. It's bad entertainment. Just stop. And I remember there's a pretty legendary story about whoever refereed that game that when they decided they were going to overturn the third call and it was going to be no goal between Leafs Devils, that apparently he joked with the situation room, are you sending me a police escort so I can get out of here alive? Like they knew how that was going to be received. And the thing is about this game, they got all the calls right. Like initially the one that I was most uncertain about, the one I thought they had wrong was the Nye's uh, disallowed goal, the one off his high stick. But our Sportsnet truck found a replay later that made it pretty clear the contact was over the crossbar. So I can't look at any of those calls and say they got it wrong. It was just, it was too much. It's, you know, you there. I don't know if you could ever say there should be a limit on the amount of calls that ever can be done because in a Stanley Cup final game seven, you got to get it right. But I totally understand why everyone was frustrated. And the goalie interference thing, like I'm looking at John Carlson on the bench as they're challenging that. And the moment I saw Dowd's path, and yes, I know there was contact with Hawk and Pa, but Dowd went into the crease himself. And I know what John Carlson's thinking. John Carlson plays a tough game. He's like, this is soft if they take it off the board. Brian McClellan, who was a really tough player, he's pulling out what's left of his hair as he's sitting there saying, I can't believe that they might not count this. But the moment I saw it, I knew it wasn't going to count. Same as in the Rangers San Jose on Thursday night on the Adam Fox goal that got taken down, when I saw the route that Trocek took and Blackwood Stick got knocked out, you know, Trocek chooses to go through the crease. I was like, that's not going to count. And I know the Sabres fans were furious about the disallowed goal with Benson. And yes, there was contact with Suter, but Benson went in there himself. And I said, this is not going to count. And, you know, I was talking about this with a retired player last night. The problem is the way it looks. It looks S-O-F-T, soft, all in capital letters, not just a capital S. It looks S-O-F-T, soft. It's not what hockey is supposed to be. Hockey is supposed to be battling. He said the goaltenders should be forced to battle a little bit. And like, I don't disagree with any of this. I hate the way this stuff looks like that. Trocek play, the goal taken down, it looks soft. The Benson play, the goal taken down, it looks soft. The Dowd play, the goal taken down, it looks soft. But we all say they're not consistent enough. They are trying to be consistent. And this isn't about now. It is about later. It's about the playoffs. Now there's a bit of lollygagging going on out there. But in the playoffs where no one takes a shift off, the Situation Room is trying to set a tone. If you go in that crease on your own, it's not going to count. You are the one taking the risk. And I only hope that this is a message received and we don't see anything like this later. It goes back to Justin Brazo and that Boston-Montreal game in the third night of the season. I remember looking at that and that goal getting disallowed for the Bruins and... I was just saying, that looks terrible, but that's the way it's going to be. And I get it. It looks awful. It looks on hockey. But they're playing the long game with this. And I, all I can say is they better remain consistent on it because it's the standard they are setting. I, I agree. Like, watching the, the Lorenz goal, it reminded me. Remember the Blake Coleman goal that was called back in the playoffs against Edmonton? Oh, yeah. And I, th- <laughs> I thought about, about that. that because I forgot. I think that goal should count. You do, hey? Yes. Because it wasn't was an, a kick? Yes. I like. I, I, it might take a rule change, but that was the one to me that I thought was fixable. If, you, if it's not a kicking motion or like a punching motion or a headbutt motion, count it. Ah, but I, I, I'm with you. But then it's like, well, what's the difference? 
Like it would be one thing if you're picking the puck up and throwing it into the net. I can understand that. But like whether he's lunging his shin forward or whether he's lunging his foot forward. Did you think that was a kicking motion? No, it wasn't. But when the referee said propelled, that's what, again, took my mind back to Blake Coleman in the playoffs a few years ago. But by the way, I still think that was the wrong call too. So you're arguing with the wrong guy here. I hated that call. Well, just... Luke Gazdix was saying last night, we want goals. I think Mike Johnson said it on X, we want goals. I'm with those guys. To me, that's a fix. Just kicking motion, punching motion, headbutt motion. Don't use propel. Change that rule. That to me is fixable. That one's fixable? Yes. I think that goal should count. I wonder if over time, you know, we we have – player puck tracking technology now actually that'll come up in the thought line a little later on Elliot so stay tuned on that front but as that technology continues to evolve like do we get to a point on like the Nye's goal is there some sort of VAR thing that could be coming where we're not relying on okay do we have the right camera angle at ice level to truly tell will there be a more uh, technological way to see okay contact is it above the crossbar or not yes no and it's a more smoother review and quicker review in that way. Got to think that something like that is possible down the line. But other than that, and some of the time I hope so, takes, because I think that would also help with goal line technology. I hope absolutely. we have the day where there's a chip in the puck in the ice that can solve is the puck in or not, too. I, I'm with you on this. All right. I, I, I just felt bad. I just felt bad for everybody in the building in particular because you have to sit through that. We're not going to solve it here today, but we won't stop talking about I, it. I, when I just hope there aren't too many more. Like, that was the confluence of everything bad that could happen with review. Even though a lot of the calls ended up being the right calls, it was just all bad. It was bad. I guarantee you the people in video review... They wanted to run out of the room and not answer the phones. They, even they were like, <laughs> yeah. too much of us to escape. All right. Matvey Michkov, Frege. Healthy scratch for a couple of games in a row. Returned against the Sharks. Goal, assist, scored in the shootout. You mentioned in your blog, though, the reason for him being a healthy scratch was because of something that happened on the bench in a previous game. Are you able to provide any further explanation to what all went on? First of all, Kyle, you have to love what Mitchkov has done since that benching. Overtime winner in Ottawa on Thursday. Boy, that's a bad loss for the Sanders. Bad loss for the Sanders. But great night for Mitchkov and the Flyers. All I know is that it wasn't anything that was like worthy of controversy. It was nothing enormous, nothing serious, probably just some exchange or body language and the flyers just said we're going to deal with this right now like i I, like you know like that's what i was told i i had heard it involved something that occurred on the bench and that it wasn't a big deal but a teaching moment that had to come out of that that's what i was told but you know what the thing i was really watching with that kyle was what's that i always wonder Like, this is a young guy who's a big stud. He's going to be a great player for a long time. And sometimes I wonder, like, when I hear something like that, what do the veterans think, right? And I think it's really instructive that in his first game back, Eric Johnson stood up for him. Like, that Giovanni Smith, Eric Johnson is a big, strong guy. He is not in Giovanni Smith's class. Like he is not, he should not be fighting Giovanni Smith. And he took him on. And like, he's not doing that if they don't like Mishkov. So I think it says a lot that he sits out, he comes back, he has a huge game, a huge game. But to me, the most instructive thing, because Couturier has fought on his half before that Johnson stood up for him right away. Smith is a is a tough customer, like a really tough customer. And there are not a lot of players in the league you, you would take in a fight against him. And I think it said a lot that Johnson uh, did it. 
Okay, David Juracek and the Blue Jackets. This is an interesting one, Elliot, because, I mean, the guy's only going to turn 21 in a couple of weeks. He was their sixth overall pick in 2022. I know there's a different regime now in charge in Columbus, but 43 games last year, only five so far this year. Healthy scratch the last two, averaging under 12 minutes a night. Now they've got Dante Fabro in the mix, claiming him off waivers from Nashville. Do you sense, have a feel of where this is all headed between team and player? You know, it was interesting. There was a quote today, and uh, Mark Shea, who's a big listener of the pod and does great work covering the Blue Jackets, I saw his his retweet um, uh, was sent to me about Dean Evison saying, you know, we went over some video and, you know, basically said you've got to earn the right to play. And... Um, you know, one of the things that I, I do believe about the Blue Jackets, and I believe some of the veterans have asked about it there too, is they want a tougher and a higher standard, right? And, you know, young kids want to play. They, they, you know, he's like you said, he's, he, he's 21 years old. He wants to play. And the other thing too is I was talking about with Mike Fuda, and Fuda was really shaking his head because he's like a 21-year-old with that pedigree. Like, you don't want to lose him. You, you you don't want to lose him. And you forget that he got hurt the year of his draft and he probably would have gone even higher. That's um, right. If if he hadn't. So you you've got a bunch of veterans there asking for a tougher standard. You you got Everson, who's a demanding coach, and you've got a kid who wants to play, and kids represented by Alan Walsh, who's no shrinking violent either. Like it's this, you know, like they had a situation uh, last year. It didn't go very well. And, you know, everybody kind of said, okay, well, we'll try to work it out. But, you know, you just worry, like, are the waters already too deep, right? And, you know, that's the thing here. Like you can see that this is a player who's chafing a bit and this is a team that's trying to set a standard. And, um players want to play that at the end of the day players want to play but it's it's a tough position for Columbus to be in because you see the players ability and you see the players talent and that age is way too early to give up on someone but you can just see that if you know like Fabro eventually got to a place where he needed a fresh start and your checks on that place now and ultimately, we'll see where it decides. And, you know, somebody said to me, ah, it's not that big a story. And I said, that's fine. You can feel that way. But, you know, kids like this don't don't become available normally that quickly after they're taken sixth overall. So I guarantee to you that there's people there watching this and curious to see where it goes. And I'll say, like, I mean, as as much as and everything that that Columbus has has dealt with over the last few months, Elliot, and though it was a tough trip out west for them over the last little while here, uh, when I was down there for the home opener, like you got a sense that there was like there is there is a certain effort uh, and how they go about things, you know, despite results haven't been where they would want it to be the last few years. That I thought was was impressive in how they're going about approaching things. So. When you mentioned about the the veterans kind of having a, a standard of of what they want to see and the coaching staff too, that doesn't surprise me in the least bit. I don't have a problem at all with a coach saying, like, these are my 18 best players or these are my 18 most deserving players and they deserve to be in the lineup. I have no issue with that. I, I, I have no problem with Dean Evison trying to set a standard for the way the Columbus Blue Jackets should prepare and play. I have no issue with that. This is simply just a realization that um, you, you come to a fork in the road sometimes with a player and how's it going to go? And that's, you know, ultimately the player's going to want to play. So everybody here is just going to have to figure it out. And Elliot, Connor McDavid on Thursday night, uh, early in the second period against Nashville. Leon Dreisaitl with the puck on his stick. Everyone in Rogers Place in the province of Alberta knew where that puck was going. He was still able to find his captain, McDavid, made no mistake to hit 1,000 career points. 
fourth fastest in NHL history to do so. It's a bit, he hit 900 points for his career in January of this year, and now he's into the it's quadruple incredible. digit mark. I really like Elliot. I mean, I don't know if you saw him uh, interview on on the ice post game, interacting yes. with the crowd, saying, you know, hey, I'm, you're making me emotional here. I'm getting emotional in my own age. Like contrary to some people's belief, Connor McDavid has always been human. He is very much human. And it was just neat to see him recognize a moment like that and talking about it afterwards, about how cool it was for him to see how his teammates reacted to it all. I mean, someone who is so focused and driven and and obviously for him, the team goal in trying to win a championship one day, but to take a moment and kind of bask in what is a pretty damn cool accomplishment. I just thought that was awesome. It, we're on the same wavelength in this one, Kyle, because that's the thing that really stood out to me too, is how much he enjoyed it. I, I really thought it would almost be the goals in it's one, one, this is a big game. We really need it. Now let's go drop the puck and play. Like he had a big smile when it happened. Um, as you talked about the on ice interview post game with Tony Brar, um, you know, he, the, the, the fans, like you're kind of getting me emotional. I was really shocked at, at how much he let everyone know that was meaningful to him. I agree with you. He really dropped his guard. It was, it was nice to see. My only critique about Wedgwood, who was playing goal on the play, is that I think Wedgwood could have just given Dreisaitl the net because there was no way that Dreisaitl was shooting that puck. Like he should have just <laughs> left Dreisaitl alone and just stared down McDavid right. because just Dreisaitl skated at him. <laughs> was, was not shooting at it. But uh, you know, and the thing too, like first of all, you saw the shirts that they were wearing post game, which I thought were great. I hope oh, they yeah. sell those, you know, charity or something like that. They'll be a huge, huge, hugely popular thing. But the other thing too is you could tell it was meaningful for him. You mentioned Dreisaitl getting the assist. Well, also they got a W and Nurse scored twice, right? So yep. you think about the guys that he's really tight with. Uh, he's tight with, obviously he's tight with more than just them, but you know, he's obviously very tight with Dreisaitl. He's very tight with Nurse. Like he defended Nurse in the playoffs last year. Um, it's, you know, I, I think that was meaningful to him too. Not just that it's his goal, but the people who kind of celebrated the game with him. And uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. It was it was it was very cool to see McDavid drop his guard a bit during his game. He let us know how much that one meant to him. I'll tell you something else, Kyle. Uh, someone asked me a really good question. He said, "If McDavid played in the '80s, do you think he'd be a 200 point a year guy?" Yeah, hundred percent. But I, no, I go back 300, at 300 points. I think we're going for. Oh, no, just kidding. Yeah. Well, but, uh, right, but it's but there. it's so like it's not even a like a realistic conversation you can have because the eras and how the game was played is so different and the technology. Well, thanks, and Mr. Science, for playing along here. Okay, like I was asking a rhetorical. Okay, <laughs> three hundred. <laughs> there you go. Three hundred in the eighties. Purely scientific answer, but he'd be you know in in that era he'd be a two hundred point guy with Lemieux and uh, and Gretzky. Really great to watch. And he pointed out, too, that, you know, when he scored 100 points in the, the COVID shortened year, the 56-game season, that Dreisaitl and Nurse had a hand in that milestone as well for him, and they were part of 1,000 on Thursday night. So the Oilers will be in Toronto on Saturday night, to adding to what's otherwise a quiet weekend. Couldn't have saved Otherwise a quiet saved. weekend in the city of Toronto. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So I knew some people who were downtown at Taylor Swift tonight, and they were texting me, and they were like, "It is carnage down here." Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. The Oilers, I know, they couldn't stay at their regular hotel because they couldn't get in there. So it, it, they just said it's it's bananas in in our city. That's that's what it's like right now. All right, Boston Bruins. 7-2, they lose to Dallas on Thursday. Dallas, by the way, 14 goals for in their last two games. Uh, but Boston, they are a 500 hockey team through the first 18 games of the season. What were the sticking points to you in another tough loss by the Bees? You know what really stood out to me in this one? Um, you know, they didn't pull Swayman. Uh, Swayman had a rough night. 
And I kind of thought in the third period, because Boston doesn't have a back-to-back. They play St. Louis on the weekend. I kind of thought they'd go to the backup. I, I kind of thought they'd pull them. And uh, they didn't. And, you know, I, I just thought it was really interesting because, you know, you could argue that he missed training camp so he can use the work. I, and I don't have a problem with that argument. But I think in a lot of those situations, you'd see the goaltender get pulled. So that raised my eyebrows there. You know, the other thing, too, is it's just, it's just weird to see them because they, they look like they're they're sorting themselves out with back-to-back shutouts. And they lose in Toronto. They get another win. They get pounded in this one. Like, they're so hot and cold. They are so up and down. And it, it's almost to me, like, sometimes teams, it's almost like they're waiting for something to happen. When when I watch them tonight, um, and, and you know, the thing is, too, is, like, so Carlo gets hit by Jamie Benn, and Zadorov comes right to his defense. And you're kind of like, oh, that's exactly what a team needs. But it didn't add anything to them. And I, I just I just look at them now and it's like, I almost think they're kind of like just waiting for something to happen. That That's just the kind of look that they have right now. It's, it's not the Bruins as we know them and understand them at this time. Uh, it's just, they're not getting out of it. And it's just, it's weird to watch. Yeah, I'm with you. Montgomery said, after the game that it, what's been most frustrating is that they haven't been able to string together consistent efforts. And that has been the one calling card of that team for years and years through injuries, whatever they've managed to still look very much like the same team over the course of, of a season. And right now they are the exact opposite. So I'm with you. Maybe something is coming down the pipe for Boston and they're all just kind of waiting for it. New Jersey devils, couple of impressive wins down in Florida, back-to-back games against the Stanley Cup champions on the road and victorious in both, 10-3 on aggregate. Well, if you look at them too, went over Edmonton, went over Montreal, a shutout of Edmonton, beat the Islanders, they lose to San Jose, 1-0 in a game, they get goalied, and then they get that back-to-back. And I like when the NHL does this with its schedule. Um... I remember years ago, uh, Winnipeg hosted Washington back to back. I think it was a, a, I think it was a Thursday night and a Friday night. And it was when Adam Oates was still coaching the Capitals and I loved it. I I thought it was, I thought it was great. I I wish we saw more of this, but I remember teams were telling me the feedback they got was their fans didn't like it. Um, They just, for whatever reason, the, the the second game just in, unless the second game was on a clearly better day of the week for scheduling it always there they always got notes of less enthusiasm for seeing an opponent back to back in the season if it wasn't the playoffs which i think is weird um i like this thing that they did with the panthers and the and the devils having them play there twice in 3 days and that game like th- those teams were riled up they had the big fight the other night, uh, Gadjevich and Dylan, and you know Gadjevich was wired again. The Devils look fantastic. Um, I'll say this: I loved that Jack Hughes got that penalty. You know, I remember Chris Chelios telling me once, I, I he didn't mind getting suspended every once in a while because it reminded people that he could still hurt them, and he <laughs> liked having that kind of reputation. I always love that quote. Um, you know, Jack Hughes, he's been playing great, really great. And if he keeps going like this, we're going to start talking about him in the MVP conversation. But, you know, one of the things about Hughes is I don't think it's a bad thing for him once in a while to do something like that. He can't do it a lot. Um, they need him on the ice, but not bad once in a while to just run over somebody and let people know that you've got it in you. I kind of liked it. Um, you know, Quinn got hit tonight by Siplikov. It was a big hit. The thing that surprised me most about it was that he got hit. Like, Quinn Hughes is a really smart player. You don't expect to see that happen to him. Um, so when I was saw it live, I was like, holy smokes. Like, that's out of nowhere. You know, maybe maybe Quinn Hughes was, was still shocked that 
as a Pacific Northwest guy that Dom said that Creed's a Seattle grunge band. Maybe that affects oh, his man. play. But, <laughs> you know, I'll say this too about Vancouver is we're waxing poetic about, about Jack and the way the Devils have gone. Vancouver's got a great record. I, I like, I, I'd be interested to see like talk. It's watched like a couple of his guys take big hits, you know, Besser's out and, 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 and Quinn Hughes took a big one tonight and they lost the Islanders. I I'd just be curious to, you know, see, you know, how he handles the next couple of days, because obviously hockey's different now and people don't like it when players have to answer for clean hits, but I can't imagine he's enjoying watching like two of his best players get run over like this. If you listen or watch, because sometimes the facial expressions are as important as what's said, but if you listen to Rick Tockett after the game on Thursday, you know, he tries the old, uh, this one's not on the players, blame it on me, but he is clearly not thrilled with what he's seeing out there. We cannot play light. We're too light of a team. You cannot guess where the puck goes. You, uh, you don't have to kill people. You don't have to ram guys to the boards, even though every once in a while I wouldn't mind it. I'd rather a guy just stay in front of a guy. That's your man. We're just spinning off people and we're not front. We're, we're, there, there's too many good goal like scramble goals. It's just a, you know, it, it, it's got to stop. You know, before we get to final thought, you've mentioned a couple times on the pod how you really like Zabinijad. He's under a lot of heat. On Wednesday, he pours his heart out. He tells everybody how tough it is. People back off. I think people understand that even though you're uh, an elite athlete and you're highly compensated, it still gets to you from time to time. And he has a better night. They beat the Sharks. And he's star in the building, gets a big ovation. Uh, that was a big night for Zabinijad. You ne He needed something good to happen to him, and it did. And they were on him like right out of the gate this season, Fridge. Like they came through. The way last year ended, you could tell it was going to be like that for him. They came through Toronto early on in the year. And like, so he went the first two games without a point, And already there were pieces being written that, oh, Zabanajad is off to a tough start. And then and he had three points in the third game of the season. And, you know, suddenly things shake out. I mean, production wise, it hasn't been poor. No, he's still just three goals on the year, but the minus four against Winnipeg was, was a tough one. And yeah, as, as you mentioned, like the off day before they played San Jose on Thursday said that this, it's the, the hardest thing ever to try to get over and, and to move on from, from a tough night like that. I remember him telling me a number of years ago, this would have been after he was traded to New York after beginning his career in Ottawa, that, you know, one of those off seasons, he kind of sat down and, and had a heart to heart with some of the the important people in his life. And it was like, where are we going to go here? Like, am I, am I going to really commit to, to be in the best athlete, the best hockey player I can be here going forward? Is this really what I, I, I want to do? Because I think when his, his pro career first started, you know, I, I think deep down there was still kind of that feeling of like, okay, I'm, I'm good at hockey. Clearly I've spent my life playing it. Do I really love it? And going through that process, Clearly his, his answer was yes, and he started to take off for a while there with the Rangers and the chemistry he's had uh, with Chris Kreider over the years uh, has, has been great when, when they get hot, as, as we've all seen there. So thought about that, you know, just listening and, and reading through his, his comments uh, after the tough night against uh, the Winnipeg Jets earlier in, in the week. But uh, just go back to thinking that this is a guy that certainly – cares that that wants to do well uh, but has just had some some stumbling blocks in the early part of of this season so was happy to see him you could see kind of the the sigh of relief after the the goal in oh, yeah. San Jose on on Thursday and maybe a a, a way to to help kickstart things uh, a little more consistently for for Zibanejad here moving forward he you needed the wide angle lens for that smile like you, you could <laughs> yeah. you could see the relief on on his face it was good for him and uh you know we'll see they got some bigger games coming up but uh when things are going badly doesn't matter who you play it doesn't matter who's on the schedule you need something to feel good about yourself and and he got it that's for sure all right and that'll take us to the final thought which is brought to you by gmc and elliot uh, the nhl recently with a 
slew of promotions internally in their front office. Uh, the names Steve Mayer, Keith Wachtel, Stephen McCardle, Julie Grand, all with promotions and new titles within the league. What should we read into this, if anything? You know, Kyle, I wrote about this last week, and I talked about it on NHL radio with uh, with Scott Lachlan and Gordy Stellick in my weekly Wednesday hit there. And someone reached out to me, and they made what I thought was an interesting comparison. The most successful league in North America by a, by a mile is what? The National Football League. Dun, 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 dun. Yes, you are right. You, you took that layup, and you didn't just lay it in. You dunked it ferociously. Great job. Thank you. The commissioner of the NFL is, is Roger Goodell. He started in the NFL as an intern in 1982, and he's come all the way up through the league. And if you ever listen to him talk, it's all about protect the shield, protect the shield, protect the shield. He's indebted to the NFL for his career, and it's 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 he's a part of it, and it's a part of him. And I think the NHL likes that. I, I you know, Steve Mayer, who's been on the pod before, is a great guest. Um, he he's had another life. You know, he was in media before. Obviously, they think very highly of him, or he wouldn't have that new title. But the other three, they've been around a while, they've grown up in the organization, and they've got a good reputation internally, very highly thought of. And, you know, for example, McArdle, I've heard his name before. I've had people say to me before that he could be uh, the, the, the next long-term commissioner. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that the most qualified person to take over if Batman ever leaves, and he might outlast us all, is Bill Bailey. <laughs> Um, like, right. you know, he's, he's, he's been the right hand man for a long time. He knows the league. He knows everything that's gone on. It, you know, he is the most seamless person and the logical person to take over. But if it isn't him for whatever reason, I think there's a good chance they're thinking about who's our Roger Goodell and mm, the lifer. I, I, I think we just got a clue. I, I, I really do. And you know, I'll say this. One thing other people are wondering is, why now? Like, this isn't the end of the NHL fiscal year. And I wonder if it has something to do with CBA negotiations. I wonder if it's got something to do with what Bettman is trying to do as a succession plan. Like, one thing about Bettman is he is fiercely loyal to people who have been loyal to him. You know, who introduced Colin Campbell at the Hockey Hall of Fame inductions? It was Batman. And, you know, he is, Campbell's been loyal to Batman, and Batman is very loyal to him. So, like, all of this stuff, like, it's just interesting. I had a long talk with someone about it this week, and, you know, we were just kind of trying to figure out what does the timing mean? What does this all mean? And then we ended the conversation by saying, doesn't matter because Batman's going to outlast us all. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, do you have any sense of when Gary Batman may even be thinking about, you know what, it's time or is it still far too early? For he, that? He's going to love this conversation. I wish I, I, I wish I could see his face when he, yeah. <laughs> not, that he not that he would listen to this garbage, but when someone yeah. tells him about it. Um, I've wondered about after the next CBA, like, does he want to get, like, he's making all this noise about getting a CBA done early. I wonder if he wants to get one done peacefully before he retires. But the other thing, like, and this was someone else who said it to me, he said, he's still earning a very good living. And, uh, even though, uh, I, I'm sure, you know, like there's always the question, how much does someone, one person need? It's not easy to walk away from a good salary. So that was the final thought brought to you by GMC. We'll take a break. When we come back, Dan McKenzie, the president of the Canadian Hockey League, he'll join us for a conversation a little later on. Before that, though, the thought line. You're listening to 32 Thoughts, the podcast.
Okay, welcome back. Time now for the thought line. 1-833-311-3232. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca. Elliot, we have had the triangle controversy. We have had, most recently, the grunge music controversy. And we've had <laughs> not so much a controversy, but the ongoing discussion about same name. Oh, you know what? Instances. I'm glad you mentioned that because I got another one of those. What do you got? Well, the first submission for the thought line this episode, Pete from Rockward, Michigan. Guys, thank you for your continued work. I currently work as the play-by-play -play voice for the USA Hockey's national team development program, but from 1991 to 2015, I was the play-by-play -play voice of the Plymouth Whalers of the Ontario Hockey League. From 2007 through 2010, the Whalers had two players named Tyler Brown. They often played on the same line even. I was asked, how are you going to handle it? I decided to go with Tyler G. Brown and Tyler J. Brown. No nickname. Nice. Not easy when they played on the same line, but I worked through it. I found out the families appreciated the effort. You know what? I believe that a thousand percent. Like a little thing like that. That's a good lesson for everybody. A little thing like that goes a long way. 100% great idea. I sent Chris Cuthbert a note just asking, like, did you have any any memories of just some, whether it was some tongue twister names or same names on the same team? He pointed out there was that brief time in Vancouver in the 80s where they had two Greg Adams. And I believe right. the great Jim Robson, I think one of them he called, he would call him Gus Adams, right? One was Greg Adams, one was Gus to help differentiate. But that was one that he came up with. Those are great. I have more coming in. I'm just looking for the one. Somebody uh, sent me one about Tyler Johnson. Tyler Johnson, the Rams receiver. Tyler Johnson, the Heat net shooting guard. And Tyler Johnson, a former Cardinals pitcher. Three played concurrently. That's Kevin who sent it in. That's actually just tweaked my mind. Remember... When Tyler Ennis, the basketball player, played yes. for the Raptors? I should say, Michael Russo sent that in. That's right. Tyler Ennis and Tyler Ennis. And they almost got each other's surgeries confused with each other. Correct. Right. When Ennis, the hockey player, was playing for the Maple Leafs. Wild story there. Ah, that's fun. All right. Nikki from New York City. Griffin, Dom, Kyle, and Elliot. How are you, gentlemen? Longtime listener, first time emailer. My question is about morning skates during game days. To put it bluntly, why do they exist? While I admit I don't follow any other league as closely as the NHL, I don't see other examples where athletes warm up early in the day, go home, nap, have a meal, go back to the rink, and then warm up again before actual puck drop. I've never understood the concept, especially considering half the time it seems like they're optional and players elect not to participate. Thanks and excellent work, Griffin and Dom. Good job, Kyle and Elliot. There's always room for improvement. <laughs> That's outstanding. That is tremendous. <laughs> Very good. Very good. I, I like that. You know, I'll say this, that I think the guy who actually created it was not morning skates. I think it was morning shoot arounds. It was Bill Sharman. And... Uh, and he was, if you have, if you watch like that series, the Magic Johnson series about the Showtime Lakers, he was featured uh, in that series. But Bill Sharman was a Hall of Fame basketball player who, who later became a very uh, successful coach. And he created the morning shoot around. Um, and, you know, if you look at Wikipedia, it said a way to burn off nervous energy on game days. But I think that it was because he wanted to get his players out of bed in the morning. So they didn't spend too much time out late the night before. <laughs> now, I'm not sure that always worked, particularly on a team that had Wilt Chamberlain on it. Uh, but but that was the reason is he, he thought that he could do something in the morning. Maybe players would sleep better the night before. And... You know, he coached the Lakers after all their years of not being able to beat the Celtics. Um, he coached the Lakers to an NBA championship in 1972, and it became a pretty widespread practice after that. So that was why initially, and I think the NHL was similar. Like, 
you know, guys didn't, coaches wanted their players sweating it out. Great. Thank you, Nikki, for that email. Up next, a voicemail. Keegan from Tennessee. Quick question. I was watching a game, and the Kids These Days commercial came on with all the young stars in the NHL. And I was wondering, how are those players compensated for that since the league technically, you know, oversees the teams which oversees their contracts? So is that something that's built into their contract? Like if they have to have a media availability for any promotional shoot that the league wants to do, or are they compensated separately? Are they compensated at all? But uh, love the pod. Thank you guys for what you do. That's a great question. Um, There is an understanding that when you sign with the team, there are certain events you do with the team. Um, like, for example, in Toronto, the Maple Leafs have a great charity event, a gala. It's called their Blue and White Night, and all the players go. Um, you know, so there are some things that you do part of the team. Um, you know, for example, you know, the league sometimes asks you to go to the media tours. You hear a lot of our interviews from the media tours, right? Um you know, there's one in Europe. That's where they shot that commercial. That's right. There's that was a that was a great commercial. There's one in Europe. There's one in North America, um, and I, I and so like those kinds of things that they can't ask a lot of you, but they can ask some of you. Um, but you know, there are other things, whether it's set up by your own agents or you know uh, through the team that you get paid for. Um, but, um, there is an expectation that you will be asked to do not many, but maybe one or two team wide charity events a year. Like I remember when I started, uh, years ago as a reporter covering the Raptors, the Raptors used to have a deal with their players. We could ask you to do five things a year. And I don't remember if that was in the CBA or not, but that was the Raptors deal. And players adhered to that. They they understood that there were some things that they had to do. But I'm just not sure what the formal wording of it is now. Jacob from Long Island. Hi, Elliot, Kyle, and Dom. Greetings from Long Island. Last Saturday, my dad and I went to see his Devils take on the Islanders at UBS Arena. With a little over six minutes left in the first period, a Luke Hughes dump into the Devils' offensive zone took a fluke deflection up into the seats and off my dad's face. Oh, boy. He hung tough, was treated by UBS Emergency Medical Services, and celebrated Jack Hughes' OT winner with five stitches to his upper lip after the game. How awesome is that? Well done, Dad. Wow. In. I guarantee you, young man, your dad really felt it. But because you were there watching, he was like, I'm not letting my kids see me in pain. I am <laughs> gotten this point. out. Good on you, Dad. So Jacob continues, his misfortune was rewarded <laughs> with the game puck that hit him. And we noticed the six implanted objects in the puck that we concluded to be the NHL's new puck tracking technology. Our question to you guys is, how does the tracking technology work? Can the NHL track where we live with this alien technology? Is Gary <laughs> Bettman now an all-seeing Alexa like an eye on our fireplace mantle? Thanks in advance. My dad and I listen to every episode. Great question. Well, well, first of all, congratulations on a memorable night that you'll never forget. Like that is dynamite. Uh, parent, child, father, son bonding. It doesn't get better than that. That's a story you guys will have to tell forever. Um, I would say this, uh, that first of all, if you've, if you're like me and you're talking about something and then you see an ad come up on your laptop or your phone dialed into exactly what you just said, you should be aware that everyone is listening to you at all times, all times. Just as I always tell people, you should never write something in a text or an email that could end up anywhere. Never do that. You should always assume that in this day and age, you are being spied on. And I'm not even a big conspiracy theory guy. I just realized that's the way it is. The one thing about that is that in all seriousness, you're not near the transmitter anymore. So you're not in a position where it can transmit usefully unless they've 
moved it right next to your house somehow. So I think you're <laughs> safe, but don't forget you're being spied on everywhere else. Awesome, awesome night. I love that story. I'm glad you guys had it together. Yeah, so that's why you see, you know, for say, for instance, Craft Hockeyville, a preseason game, right? There's no player puck tracking data for that game because those arenas that they're played in aren't equipped to be able to handle it. It's only the NHL buildings. Actually, you know, last week we had Michael Rubin on with Fanatics. That was another wrinkle that uh, jersey collectors love about the the authentic pro jerseys that are available at retail. Uh, on the shoulder, they have the reinforced little area where they would oh, put they do, the, eh? uh, the chip for player tracking on their jerseys. So that was a nice little feature for those that, that care about that sort of thing too. Great story, great question. That, you know what, and that is, that is a great story and a great question. The other thing it reminds me of is that when the NHL knew they were gonna put a chip into the puck, one of the things that they fought hard about was they wanted to make it that the price was never prohibitive because they never wanted to be in a position where they had to go into the crowd and ask for the puck back. They said, if these pucks get shot into the crowd, we have to be okay with the fact that we're gonna lose them, that fans are still gonna keep them. Like we can't be going to them and saying, hey, we've got an expensive chip in there, we need that back. And that was a big part of their process. And it was smart, because you know, if that would have happened, it would have been a PR disaster for the league. Right, and it was the case for a period of time during the, the Fox tracks days, was it not? Was there not stories of having to go retrieve those because of the the technology that was in them? Actually, you know what? I think you're right, actually. I kind of forgot about that. That's good that they moved on. Yeah, they didn't want that this time. They were like, yeah. nope, we're not doing that. It's smart. All right, we'll wrap with Isaac from Bowmanville, Ontario. Hello, Kyle, Elliot, and Dom. I watched the Ottawa and Boston game back on Saturday where Brady Kachuk had nearly more shots on goal, 12, than the entire Boston team had that game, 16. It left mm. me wondering, has there ever been a game or games where one player alone had more shots than the entire opposing team? Longtime listener, love what you guys do and appreciate the consistent quality of the podcast. That's debatable. P.S. <laughs> P.S. He says... I'm a paralegal student. You guys would definitely be my first call at Friedman and Bukowska's injury law if I ever get injured. Yes, the word of mouth is spreading. Call someone good. That's the best advice I would give you uh, first. I appreciate that, but call someone good. Um, okay, do you know the answer to this question? Yes, I do. I had to look okay. into it as usual. Yeah, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I have to say there's one game that jumps out into my head and I don't know what the answer, if it's right. Was it the game where Ron Tugnut made 70 saves and Ray Bork had like 20 shots? No, it wasn't. But I appreciate that that's where your mind went. Because if you remember, Ron Tugnut had a game where he made 70 saves in March 1991 against the Bruins. And I don't know off the top of my head how many saves the Nordiques had, but Bork had, I think, 19 or 20 shots that game. So that's the first one that jumps out into my head. What's the answer? So it's happened one time only. One time? In the NHL. That's since it? Since they started tracking shots on goal, which was the 59-60 season. Okay, so what year are we in here? 1978. Whoa. Off the top, I got nothing off the top of my head. Give me a team. The Washington Capitals were involved. Was it Dennis Marouk? Was he there? Or was he in Cleveland at the time? Sorry, the Capitals were the team that were outshot by one player. The Flyers were the other team. Oh, really? The Flyers outshot the Capitals? Uh, I'll go with, well, one of their biggest snipers at the time was Reggie Leach. Bango. Nice. No kidding. He had eight shots on goal on February 12th, 1978. The Capitals had seven total. Oh my God, that's terrible. Yeah, I think Leach didn't even score. The Flyers won 4-1, but Leach only had an assist to show for it along with eight shots on goal. Well, I hope that assist was on a rebound. Wow. I, you know, I, like I said, I, I never would have gotten that. I, I had one name that jumped to my head and I never would have gotten that. That was pretty darn good. Yeah, so it's only happened once since they started tracking shots on goal. So a very worthy question from Isaac. That's a great question. A reminder, 
you want to submit something, a thought, a question, opinion. It'd be tough advice. to beat that father son story. What a great, what a great story. What a great such story. a dandy. Yeah. One eight three 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 one one thirty two thirty two. The email thirty two thoughts at sportsnet.ca. When we come back, our conversation with Dan McKenzie, the president of the CHL, on thirty two thoughts, the podcast. Welcome back to 32 Thoughts. So in case you missed it, last week, the NCAA voted to a seismic rule change that CHL players will now be eligible to play NCAA hockey starting next season. This was a decision that the CHL itself was not a part of, but it very much impacts them. Dan McKenzie is the president of the Canadian Hockey League, was kind enough to spend some time with Elliot and I this week to discuss so many questions that remain in the aftermath of this news. Here now, our conversation with Dan McKenzie of the CHL. So I think with the news last week, of course, of the NCAA uh, changing its rules of eligibility for players, something that has been on the radar for a while now, but naturally a lot of questions have come out of that already. What are some of the questions top of mind for yourself in the aftermath? Well, I think first of all, uh, I think there's a, a feeling um, on our end that overall this is a very good development for the player and, we, and, and for our players overall, current players and future players. So I think we're we're happy about that. We think it's going to give them, um, for our current players, it's going to give them more opportunities to consider, um, you know, as they kind of come through the CHL and finish their careers. And then for for um, you know future players, we think that it, it's going to be positive because yeah, you always had that scenario whereby if you're an elite young player, you're 15 years old, you know you needed to make some decisions <clears throat> that uh, were going to be very impactful on the rest of your life at a really young age. And so this way, it sort of releases that tension and allows you know allows you to continue to play in, in what we would view as the best league in the world. Um, best development league in the world for 16, 17, 18, 19 year old players. Um, and for most of our players, it allows them to play closer to home <clears throat> as they cont- continue to pursue those dreams. Um, and, and it, it, it doesn't, you know, force you to make some life altering decisions at, at, at the young age. I've been really interested in watching the statements from the various Canadian League commissioners, Dan. Dan Neer did it, uh, Brian Crawford in, in the West. I saw Brian Crawford's in Ontario. And they took pains in their statements to say that we welcome players going the NCAA route once their commitments to their current league or their Canadian Hockey League is finished after their 19th season. Now, I've been around long enough to know that these kinds of things are never included by accident. So it looks to me like this is what the Canadian Hockey League is saying. We welcome this as long as you stay through 19. Do you think that's enforceable? Can that be adhered to? Well, right now, I mean, all of our planning uh, has been around how we, you know, support these players who are graduating from our leagues. Make sure they understand what's involved if they want to play in NCAA, and also uh, making sure NCAA schools get a chance to properly scout our league. I mean, as you guys know, we're big league, sixty teams. It's a big undertaking, especially you know with news coming sort of mid-season. So, um, I'd say related to that, all players who are who play in the CHL today have made certain commitments to their teams, and in return, those teams have made commitments to those players. So, I mean, our teams are going to honor those commitments or in the expectations of players will as well. We think that the number of players who would consider leaving our league early for the NCAA is really small, given the environment that the CHL provides. I mean, as again, as you know, our the schedule our teams play is a, is a, you know, pro like schedule, 68 games versus 34. Um, players get a guaranteed academic scholarship when they, when they, when they're finished. Um, the opportunities when you're when you're an older player, 18, 19 year old player on your team, whether it be you're in a leadership position, you know, you get lots of ice time, you play in the PK and the power play. Um, oftentimes 
those players are the ones that, that that drive towards winning a league championship or getting an opportunity to compete for the Memorial Cup. These are all factors that come into play when we're talking about elite players and the decisions they're going to make. So we feel pretty confident that players are going to want to stay with their teams. And right now the focus really has been on 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 that graduating class and making sure they can take advantage of the opportunities that are ahead of them. So you mentioned the scholarships uh, Dan, and I know you come from a teaching background, so education is is near and dear to you. And even as you say, if you believe that it would be a small number of players that would even be looking at a scenario like that, that if they chose to maybe go from a uh, Canadian Hockey League to the NCAA after graduating high school or after their 18-year-old season, I mean, do you see a scenario if, if that were to happen, they would then forego their scholarship opportunities through the Canadian Hockey League? You know what, Cal? It's a good question. I think it's that's something that we haven't spent a ton of time yet on determining. Again, this thing just changed last week, so we're. I think we needed to determine what the you know what the future is going to look like on scholarships. As I've said in the past, and and as our teams believe, you know the the CHL really does provide the best of both worlds. We we think it gives players an opportunity to you know if you have professional hockey dreams to to really help develop those. But also, if you don't, and you know, a, the vast majority of our players don't play in the NHL, for them, the scholarship program is really important. And you know, I've I haven't been part of any discussions so far that have talked about, you know, changing anything on the scholarship front um, at this point. But again, we haven't dug too deeply into all the implications and the scenarios that uh, would happen in, uh, you know, as we're talking about, you know, players who are still uh, who aren't finished their time. Uh, in the CHL yet, so I, I think we need a bit more time to determine, you know, what what, what all the implications there might be. But um, there, there's a lot of different roads or scenarios we could go down, but we're not quite there yet. Well, one family said to me that that is the single biggest question that they have is where, how does it all work? Um, will the players who switch back and forth because you know, people forget too in the NCAA, you think you get a scholarship and you think you get it for four years. No, it's renewable after every year. So they think that that is the biggest question that needs to be answered for a lot of them is how the post playing education is going to work. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And I think it's, it's, it's critically important. And I think for, for us and for our, um, you know, for our, our players, it's going to be really important um, pillar as it relates to, um, you know, decisions you make after your playing career is over. If you're not, if you're not going to, you know, go pro, um, I think we have to determine, uh, you know, if there are any, any implications, um, but the, again, the NCAA guidelines and regulations, uh, we're, we're just digging, digging into them, um, as to, you know, what players can accept and not accept. So as I say, we're, we're working through those things. But it's it's uh, it's a really important uh, part of the package that our that our 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 uh, teams currently offer, and I think that as we look to a world you know down the line where uh, players and their families <clears throat> on both sides of the border need to make decisions on where their player is going to play, I think it's going to become a really important um, recruiting tool for our teams as well. Um, uh, because the the educational package is really 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 important. One one of the things, uh, Dan, that someone said to me was he thinks the CHL could become even younger. Uh, right now, uh, the WHL has a 14-year-old draft, Ontario 15 and Quebec 16. Um, he's curious to see if Ontario and Quebec drop to the WHL number just so that players and teams know earlier when they're, like what their path could be. That way, players have a better idea. Am I happy with this? Teams have a better idea of saying, hey, you're with us. How can we convince you to come? And they're curious to see if that makes the Canadian leagues even younger because of the option to go to NCAA schools. Do you think that's a possibility? Well, it's funny because I, I've also heard, I, first of all, right now, given a, a change that's this monumental, there's been a lot of you know, a lot of discussions uh, that have a variety of viewpoints in terms of what's going to happen. And anybody who says they know what's going to happen is, is, um, is, uh, you know, is kidding it's, it's themselves bit, and you. It's, yes. It's a bit, it's a bit wishful thinking, but um, yeah, I think, I think that, 
I, what I think what I had heard was some people thought maybe it might go the other way, and because the you know the if you look at the success rate of um, the O and the Q versus the Dub in terms of some of the picks, you, because the players are a year older and have another year of development, they've had a lot more success. I think their success rate is a bit rated is a bit higher, and that might be the reason why you move it move it up a year. I think all these questions are gonna we're gonna have to deal with as we go forward. Again, we're not there yet. Um, I think overall, though, we are going to probably see guys, um, a, a bunch of families um, at that age, younger age level, whatever it is, 14 or 15, um, considering the CHL when they never would have before. Um, mm-hmm. Agreed. Part, part, part of it because of, because, because of the, um, you know, now the, the idea that uh, you can play in the CHL and keep your academic options open in the U.S. are, are, are there. Um, partly, I think, just because of the quality of our league, um, but then partly just because of the, the the way, depending on where you are in North America, you know, I think we need to do a better job at the CHL now of telling our story in places where maybe we never have before. And I think about, you know, maybe some kids in who who, who come through hockey in Minnesota, high school hockey in Minnesota, which is obviously a very, very strong development system, New England, those kinds of places where, um, again, there never would have, because of the the NCAA rules, they never would have, they never even would have considered the CHL. And I think now um, they, they might. And so when you talk about, I know Elliot, your question was about the draft age of us getting younger, but I think they're also, we also might find that we get a bit younger in terms of, you know, young elite players who wouldn't have considered us before who are now going to look at us. So how much influx of interest are you kind of bracing for then with all of that in mind? Uh, we're, that's what we're spending a lot of our time on right now. Um, there, there's been a, a fair, a, a fair number of transfers into our league and, uh, we have, uh, transfer agreements in place with USA hockey that sort of govern all that kind of thing. So, um, that's begun to happen. I think, um, you know, our, for our teams, I think it really becomes an opportunity for them to, again, probably knock on some doors that they haven't before. So, uh, I think that's that's one of the unknowns, Kyle, in terms of what what the impact's going to look like. I also think that we may receive a bit more interest from from European players who who had NCAA aspir- aspirations, and again wouldn't have considered us. So that's that's another avenue that we may need to start to look at as well. Expansion. That's what I'm hearing a lot of too. I'm hearing Massachusetts. Um, you know, there's been reports of USHL teams. Uh, potentially reaching out to the CHL about joining it. Are you going to be a bigger league in a few years? That is something that, again, I think we've we've just begun to to start to talk about at our at our table. Um, and, and and just for clarity, the way it works uh, with expansion is those decisions are made by each individual league. Mm-hmm. So um, when you talk about Massachusetts as an example, that would be a decision Quebec. that the QM the QMJHL would make. But um, but I think that, listen, this is th- this kind of change is transformational change, and uh, you know I think that um, there's some real excitement in our organization, and I think in probably other organizations about you know in the hockey world, you know, at this particular point in time, you know, in terms of what the possibilities for junior hockey in North America could look like going forward, we don't have the answers. We don't know exactly where it's going to go, but. I think that, uh, you know, th- there's some real opportunity here. We just have to determine what it, what it looks like. So I was wondering uh, on that note, Dan, and again, understanding this is all still very fresh. I mean, we had Brian Crawford on a couple of months ago, and it was still hypothetical at, at that point, but he talked about how he saw it as a great opportunity for his league. But on the flip side, has anyone from, you know, your three major junior leagues in the country come to you with, any concerns about, hey, maybe this is something we haven't totally considered yet uh, as a domino effect or trickle down effect with uh, the new agreement? Not really. Again, I think I think uh, this has been there's been this has been signaled for a while. So we've you know we've we've started to think through the possibilities. I think the one thing that nobody really knew was what the form it was going to take was going to be. Um, you know, the NCAA is an organization that 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 you know they have their processes and they they the language and the how things work within their rules. It was really their rule that they were changing. So, um, you know, I think we needed to see the text of that and then begin to deal with the implications. But um, I, I I haven't listen. I, I think there's always people who are resistant to change and nervous about change and what that means. 
but I think in this particular case, uh, as it relates to, you know, our, you know, the, the CHL and, you know, the, the leagues that are a part of the CHL, I think we feel pretty confident that, um, you know, we are the number one development league in the world. I think half of the NHL 300, I think our numbers last year was this year at the beginning of the year was 390 CHL graduates on the NHL roster. So basically half the league, uh, 88 draft picks in the, in the NHL draft last year, which was, you know, number one, um, you know, we feel pretty confident that, that players are going to want to play in our league. And so, you know, we understand there's going to be changes the way we operate. We're going to have to change a little bit, uh, you know, the way that, um, you know, maybe the way our commitments to our players and vice versa, that may have to change a little bit going forward, but we're, we're going to be ready to do that. And we think at the end of the day, um, we're pretty well positioned. We're very well positioned to be the, you know, the choice for elite players at that age group, 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds. Dan, there's always a concern about some of the smaller markets, the Owen Sounds in Ontario, some of the Saskatchewan cities, for example, in, uh, in, in Western League. Do you worry about this making it even harder for them to compete? Um, not really. I mean, we have they, they the I've heard that that is, that issue before and and listen, every league has that, right? Has markets that are bigger than others and smaller than others, but if you look at our track record of the you know, the teams that have been like I've been here now for I've had three Memorial Cups and every year the teams have been different. And there have been big markets, small markets. Teams find a way. And I think if you if you run, if you have good ownership and you run a good hockey operation, you can compete. And um, so I think, you know, again, like other leagues, that's the formula. Um, you know, we have systems in place to distribute players who come into the league, high-end players. Um, and so I think that will do its work. Um, but again, it's really up to the, going to be up to the clubs to make sure they have the right, and people and personnel and processes to, to, you know, to, to build their teams. Um, we have talked a bit, we had a meeting about a month ago in Toronto, we brought together all 60 um, teams from the CHL into one place for a meeting. It was the first time it had been done in about 25 years. And one of the things we did talk about was stand certain, certain standards in certain areas. And so, you know, we'll see where that goes. I know our leagues are, it's a topic our leagues are beginning to, to dig in on. So, We'll see where that goes. But uh, again, I think the formula, you know, big, big team, big markets and small markets in our league can, you know, can win league championships in the Memorial Cup. And I think the history dictates that. Would you say the three major junior leagues in Canada, do they get along? Like, are they able to collaborate on big issues when called upon? You can tell us if it's like herding cats, like it's okay. You can tell <laughs> <Yeah>. us. <laughs> Well, it's it's interesting, you know. I I uh, I mean, it, it's funny. So, so I started in 2019, uh, and I'm now the uh, the old man at the table uh, when we get together with the commissioners because right. Dan and and Brian are within the last year, and Mara was only you know uh, the year before that. So I was pretty fortunate when I first started to get to spend you know my first few years in the league with you know the likes of Dave Branch and Ron Robinson and Gilles Courteau, you know, who were you know, I'd, I'd say they were transformational leaders for their leagues for a long time and, you know, really did set the standard for us. But I think they also, one of the things that, that they also did is, in, uh, you know, in, in, in most areas, they were very, they were able to work together and do what was best for, for the leagues and for the players and teams. So <clears throat> I think this new group uh, of commissioners that we have, uh, Dan, Brian, and Mario, you know, they're all, in a position where they want to drive growth, they want to they, they, they want to make their mark. Um, you know, I don't think any of us are gonna you know have a career where we're we're in the league for thirty years. I think I think we all have a, a you know an understanding that we want to get some things accomplished. So there is a bit of a commitment to to trying to work together, understanding that you know <clears throat> sixty teams is a lot of teams, and you know what what may work in you know Shakutami may not be the best thing that might work in a market like Portland. So there needs to be regional, you know, some regionality built in, in terms of the decision-making. But I, I think there is a commitment to uh, work together and to do what's best for the, for the collective. That is definitely something that we've talked about and that there's been a commitment towards. Are you worried about poaching at all? Like I've been very careful to say, I don't know what a player like Gavin McKenna is thinking, but do you worry about NCAA teams 
coming at him now? Uh, well, you know, like I said, I, I think the, I think the, our focus right now has been on not on that age group of player um, or a player like him, Elliot. It's been more on the graduating players. Um, I but think, you, but that- uh, but d- but somewhere, Dan, you have to, like you you have to know that there's sharks in the water, right? Like even though it's a different era now. Uh, the NCAA guys, like there's, they have fierce pride and they want to win the fight against the CHL. You, you know that people have got to be thinking about this. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, I think historically, absolutely. I, I think there's a lot of factors that go into whether or not a player like a Gavin McCann is going to leave, and so, and 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 that, and those decisions and those factors are very different than if it's another player. So I think we got to be a little bit careful about about when you, you, I think your question was, am I worried? And the answer truly is I'm not. I think that I think that we I'm really comfortable in what we what our what our you know I said it earlier some of the reasons why players want to play in the CHL. I think those stand whether you're Gavin McKenna or you're someone else. And so, you know, listen, do I have a crystal ball? No. Do I you know if 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 things arise, we're going to deal with them? Yes. But we're not in a position right now where I can, you know, where, where I want to speculate on what's going to happen or what the issues might be for individual players. But I think we'll be able to deal with them. I really do. I feel really confident in the in our, in, in our league's ability to to uh, you know continue to be the best development league in the world and be the an, an off, a great place for players to to develop when they're eighteen and nineteen years old. Um, with the changes that 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 got made, I I don't see that changing. Do you think Dan that there will be partnerships, sort of like um, loose alliances put together, like NCAA schools and CHL teams will call each other and say, look. Uh, we've got a player who wants to come when they're a little bit older to our school. What about we place him with your team, and then when you're done, you just remind him that he made a commitment to this school. Do you think that could happen? Potentially, I, I think the the it would like it would likely happen after they're at you know after they're at the, their CHL teams, given the ages we're talking about, when our drafts are and when they can make commitments. I, I don't think they sync up perfectly right now. You might know better than I, but I don't think they do. I so can assure I you, gonna... I don't know anything more than you do, Dan. Let's let's just put that out there right <laughs> okay. away, right now. Yeah. Well, I think that um, I think it, it, it's it's interesting because when you talk about the kinds of things you just talked about earlier about, I think you I think you used the word poaching. Um, you know that that's it's 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 interesting to then bring what you just brought up because at the end of the day, um, the relationships that get built and that are going to get built because right now there aren't a, there aren't a lot of them because of the history, but the relationships that get built between NCAA D1 schools and CHL GMs are going to be really important, <clears throat> and so I think um, you know uh, I think I think I think that's going to be. Um, something that's going to, again, it's going to be like any relationships that get built on, you know, doing what you say you're going to do and trust and open communication and all those things on, on both sides. And so I think that, 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 you know, the, the, the kinds of situation you just raised, um, you know, could happen in the future. And I think probably will happen in the future, but um, I think, I think it's going to be built on the fact that probably the side, the two sides are going to have to work together a little bit more than they currently do. And and our teams have had a, a long history of, of those kinds of working relationships with U sports. Um, and it'll continue with the NCAA. What Elliot's really is hoping for is like a remake of WWE versus WCW in the nineties. <laughs> yes. That's what he's, yeah, that's, that's what I need. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. So you, you brought up U sports and that's, because it's exactly what I wanted to ask about, Dan, because um, you've talked about a number of times the importance of the partnership is with them. And I think that's the U sports hockey is one of the the best kept secrets that really shouldn't be a secret at all in, in Canada in terms of uh, hockey and how entertaining that level is to watch. Have you thought at all about what this decision means for them and the pipeline of players that would be heading that way in the future? We have, we and we've had, we have had, we have had uh, good dialogue with U Sports about that, and if there are things we can do to continue to support that partnership. So, those discussions are ongoing, and um, you know, um, it's an, it, it's a definitely an important avenue for a lot of players. I I, I think I I don't necessarily subscribe to um, the fact that once the dust settles, that 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 um, I think I see it as, as there's just going to be a lot more opportunity, um, and I think it it ties a little bit into 
yes, some players, of course, are going to choose the NCAA. That's that's inevitable. But I think um, I think that you know, again, not unlike the decisions we were talking about for an elite player like a Gavin McKenna, um, in terms of what he what he would decide to do. I think if you're a player who's making decisions on your educational um, career and where you want to go, um, you know, youth sports is going to stack up really well with NCAA. Uh, I think in a lot of areas, especially when you factor in proximity to home. And so when you're a 20 year old, 21 year old, uh, young student, you, you know, do you want to be far away from home? So I, I think we may be in a scenario whereby, um, you know, I think U sports is going to be able to retain a fair amount of the players that, uh, that uh, will come from the CHL. And, and I also think that it, it it's probably going to, we're probably going to see some kind of alignment in the system below the CHL and, and it, it could create some real opportunities for junior A players who maybe right now don't get the opportunities in U sports because CHL players are, 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 you know, uh, taking up a lot of the spots. If some CHL players go NCAA, it could create more opportunities for U sports um, teams to bring in players maybe from that next level. And I think it, that, I think, all of that is positive in terms of aligning the system and pro- providing more opportunities for these young student athletes. Dan, the NHL has kind of adopted the position that we're staying out of this uh, until uh, we have to, and that is setting rules for once players are drafted into their league. Um, but one of the questions I'm curious about is, do you think this will lead to a change in either or both or any of the following two situations making the draft a 19 year old draft and but an 18 year old first round or the current nhl chl agreement which would change the age or change ahl eligibility do you worry about or see either of those things being on the horizon well i think both i think both of those are decisions that the nhl you know and their gms and ultimately I think uh, the PA are going to have to make right. So that's very much. I, I think what you said off the top is correct, and I've I have spoken to 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 Bill Daly a little a little bit about this in terms of you know, um, you know where, you know what what the impacts might be, but but it's very much, you know, going to be their you know their their decisions and their negotiations, and then we'll when it gets to the CHL NHL agreement, we'll you know we can deal with those things uh, directly, but. It's it's pretty. I think it's kind of hard to to predict what that might look like, right now. Um, again, as I said earlier, we're going to be. Uh, I think we're going to be in a really good shape from a talent perspective in our league, to be able to continue to be a place where you know NHL teams can feel comfortable putting their their you know drafted players when they're 19. Um, I know the NCAA. I think the NCAA rule also indicates that if you've signed a deal. Um, if you've signed an NHL contract that, you, you know, you're not eligible for the NCAA. So right again, we, we just feel pretty confident that we'll be a good, a good, really good place for, for, for teams to put their players. But those, <clears throat> the specifics around that, around the draft, around, you know, how they want to, where they want to take the return provision and, and also just the whole topic of, you know, um, retention rights, you know, depending on where you come, where you get drafted out of that, those are all decisions for the NHL. Uh, and and their constituencies to make. I, I guess my last one on this topic would be Dan is that you know now the, the the rule for the NCAA takes effect this August. Does that mean that it's like studying for an exam, or at least the way I used to do it? It's the night before I better start. So you guys have several months here where you have to figure all this out. Like, does is this mean like sort of a a quick track to answering some of these questions and putting policy on paper? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and I think I think you and I know I was in the same boat as you, Elliot, in terms of the <laughs> night before the exam. So uh, <laughs> that, that was my move too. But um, absolutely, I think this. The, I think one of the things that we were a little bit concerned with, you know, over the last month as we were, you know, talking to our partners and the in the development pipeline was that, that, you know, changes might happen and take effect during the season, which we think would have created some real chaos in the system. So the fact that, that, you know, the decisions won't, won't happen until August, um, I think is, it gives us some runway to be able to try to figure some of the, some of the stuff out. And, um, I feel pretty confident that we're going to be able to do that. So, uh, but it it is going to be a bit of a process for sure. Just wanted to ask kind of a, a bigger picture Dan because you know, for those that don't know like you work 
for NBA Canada for the better part of 20 years before taking the job at the the CHL. And I mean, we're seeing the fruits now of, of all the growth of, of basketball and in our country and the, the time that, that you were there. And if I read correctly, I mean, part of the, the reasons for that is that you really targeted, you know, a younger demographic uh, in those early years uh, with NBA Canada. And so as you look now uh, and opportunities of, of growth with Canadian Hockey League, and I mean, the player development is one side, but also the the interest of, of fans to, to watch and to tune in every season. Where are kind of the, the areas you're looking at now for maybe some some untapped potential uh, to try to grow the sport at that level here in Canada? Well, you know what? It, it, thanks for bringing that up because I think the, the, the parallels are pretty um, – are pretty apparent to me anyway. Um, when I started at the NBA, um, and Elliot, I think, were you doing Raptors basketball back in those days? In the yeah, it's, yes, it's, we it's, all know it's, he it's, used it, to cover it, the NBA. It, it, I was laughing at Kyle's question, your answer, because it's a running joke on this podcast how I referenced that. Yes, yeah, so it was it was pretty <laughs> funny as, as Kyle there was doing go. that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, and, and uh, court surfing on the score, right? That was the... That's right, that was, yep. Those, I remember. I remember that that was one. Of, that was a great program back in the day. They but, did a um, great job, and and a great example, I think, of some of the some of the time innovation <clears throat> to you know to be able to try to attract audiences that didn't want to sit through one whole game, right? So, I think that kind of thinking is the sort of thing that we need to apply to um, to our to to to, our, to you know, our business as we go forward. I think the one thing that we really focused on <clears throat> at NBA Canada back in those days in the late nineties was really digging into immigration trends. And when I, when I used to go out and, you know, do TV deals or, or sponsorship deals and I would talk to companies, a lot of it was about how, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of, of newcomers were arriving to Canada and they, um, they had a love for soccer and basketball. Those were the sports they knew. And so, you know, as a, as a company or as a, as a media partner, you know, there, there was going to be real opportunity and, and, and we, we've now sort of seen it come to fruition. I think the reverse is, is our challenge with, uh, with, in, in the hockey world. And I think it's, I don't think we can do it on our own at the CHL. I think we have to do it in partnership with, you know, some great partners that we have in terms of Hockey Canada and the NHL and some of our corporate partners. But we have to make sure that I, I think from, from our standpoint, we have we have 10 million fans who come through our arenas across all of our all of our buildings. Um, that's a lot. That that's more than all the NHL teams combined because we're in, you know, 60 markets. And so I think what we need to make sure that we do and 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 our teams are really focused on it is how do we make sure that our buildings are welcoming to everybody? And so that when, and as immigration, um, you know, patterns, you know, move outside of the major centers, the, the places where a lot of newcomers are landing are in markets where there's CHL teams. And in those markets, you know, the junior hockey team is the number one thing in town. So we got to make sure that our, that our buildings and our teams are focused on attracting new people into their buildings and, and making them feel welcome. Um, we actually had our, at our meetings we had in Toronto last month, we had, uh, Bobby Sani, who's a, he's a, he runs a company called Ethnicity or Ethnicity Matters. And he spoke to our owners about just about that fact is how do we, how do we make sure that, um, that, uh, CHL buildings are places where people feel comfortable. And once he finished speaking, there's a bunch of owners that came up and wanted to get his card and talk to him about strategies they could, they can employ to do that. So, um, that's one, I'd say tactic in the strategy, but there's a, there's a, there's a few of them and we've got to focus on it. You have the CHL USA Prospects Challenge coming up at the uh, end of November. And it's probably great timing for this because a lot of the kids and people are going to have uh, a lot of questions. But what are you expecting for this one? And uh, how um, how intense do you expect the hockey to be? I would think pretty intense, but what are you thinking? Yeah, you know what, Elliot, you're right. I, I think for and for those who, who don't, maybe maybe aren't aware of, um, of what... Um, this is, is, is it's, it's a bit of, I call it the evolution of our top prospects game. And um, so we, we traditionally would run a top prospects game that would include 40 players um, from across the CHL and they would play each other in a, in a, in a neutral third, third part, in a neutral uh, third party site. Um, and we did that for years. And what we uh, made the, the, the what, what we decided to do um, 
about a year ago is try, try to explore is where are there some elements we can change in that uh, in that in that property to make it a bit more compelling both you know to watch on television and to watch in the arena and um, it sort of ties a little bit I think to what you just said about about making you know putting some more uh, some more you know bite into the game we'll call it um, we ended up approaching USA Hockey about whether or not they would have interest in having uh, their national team come up and play um, in a two game series against the best draft eligible prospects in the CHL. So, um, and they, they agreed. And so what this game, so, so we have a game on November 26th in London, Tuesday, November 26th in London, Ontario, and Wednesday, November 27th in Oshawa. Um, and what fans are going to get treated to is a two game series that has the best prospects in the CHL playing against the U S national team. Uh, a national development team program. <clears throat> Based on our projections, we think that you're going to have probably 60, more than 60% of the first round of the NHL draft on the ice uh, during these games. Um, and it is going to be, again, CHL versus USA. So, you know, tying a bit to that sort of Canada-USA rivalry, we know that from speaking to our friends at the NHL, <clears throat> their scouts are really excited to be able to to look at watch these prospects play in two games um, uh, versus the traditional one. And, you know, we think that the, the compete level is going to be really high. So if, if, if fans are in Southern Ontario and they want to go see this event, <clears throat> it's really easy to do so. CHL.ca slash prospects challenge. Um, London and Oshawa, uh, you know, when you, if you go to events in those buildings, you can just go onto their websites and buy tickets, but it's, it should be a great series and we're really excited to, uh, to see how it does. So it kind of sounds like almost the, the amalgamation of, as you say, the, the top prospects game that have been around for years, but also the, the Canada Russia series, like it's kind of taken those two ideas and, and turning it into what you have coming up here. That's, that's a great way to put it. Kyle, absolutely. Dan, we really appreciate uh, the time with us uh, here today. Thank you so much for for hopping on. No problem, guys. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. So once again, thanks to Dan McKenzie and the Canadian Hockey League for making that happen. That'll do it for this episode of 32 Thoughts. For those looking for their hockey fix this weekend, you know where to find it. Hockey Night in Canada is back. The usual Hockey Central Saturday pregame show gets underway at 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific, Four early games this weekend. Plenty to keep you busy. Connor McDavid and the Oilers are in Toronto. Montreal hosts Columbus. Winnipeg look to keep it rolling down in Florida. And Ottawa is in Carolina. The nightcap this Saturday, Connor Bedard and the Chicago Blackhawks go to Vancouver. Bedard's back in his hometown on Saturday night. Enjoy all of it. Have yourselves a great weekend. And we'll talk to you again on Monday.